Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, where we discuss digital transformation and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here, some of the most innovative thinkers and leaders in healthcare and technology talk about how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to have as my special guest today, John Alamka, who is the former CIO of Beth Israel Deaconess and is now the executive director of the Health Technology Exploration Center for Beth Israel Lehi Health. John, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much. You're most welcome. So, John, let's start with this. After a long career as CIO, you're now leading an exciting new initiative. Tell us how Technology Exploration Center came about and what are you focused on? Sure. So if we look at the evolution of healthcare or digital health innovation throughout the world, what you're seeing is an explosion of apps, cloud services, wearables. But does anyone really know if these work or not? How to integrate them into workflow? where they're helpful to patients or providers or payers? The answer is not totally. And that building an exploration center inside an operational healthcare system to test out uh, worldwide emerging technologies seemed like a reasonable next step. After 23 years of being in an operational role, I now am in a mentorship and guidance role for uh, many, many young faculty and those who are part of the Beth Israel Leahy Health Innovation Ecosystem. Right. And thank you for that. Now, you know, you and I met at the Harvard Med School Executive Education Program where you were on the faculty. You talked a lot about what you're seeing in digital health and digital transformation of healthcare across the globe based on the work that you've been doing. Now, healthcare in the United States is in early stages of digital transformation, and the definition of digital varies from health system to health system. How do you define digital? What, how is digital different from traditional IT? Sure. So how about this? We're all on a journey to turn data into information, knowledge, and wisdom. And when I see some healthcare systems that say, oh, we've gone digital, we have created PDFs of paper records, we've digitized fax workflows, well, okay, I mean, yeah, that's digital paper, but is it really possible to do machine learning on a fax? Are we able to, with a digitized PDF, to do structured you know, analytics using vocabulary controls? Well, not so much. So to me, digital means codified, vocabulary-controlled data that is capable of serving systems that turn it ultimately into wisdom. That's a very interesting definition. I'll come back to the question of data and advanced analytics and all of that in a bit. I just want to spend a minute again on the current state of digital in healthcare. Even the health systems that we work with and we track, they're driving digital mostly as a portfolio of standalone projects, right? Somebody's doing telehealth, someone else is doing remote monitoring, hospital home, all kinds of things. A small handful of enterprises are taking a step back and looking at digital as an enterprise strategy. What's your take, John, on the current state of digital transformation by applying the definition that you just applied? Where are health systems in this journey today? Sure. So how about this? Our trajectory is good. Our position is imperfect. (laughs) And what do I mean by that? My daughter is 27. In her life, she will experience coordinated care that gives her the data from each visit on her phone. And I have had a mostly paper-based medical record in my life. And of course, my mother has had nothing but paper, right? So, hmm, you know, we have gone over the course of the last 50 years to the codification of problem lists, medication lists, allergy lists, labs, and RADs. We've got federal regulations that are encouraging us to share data across the community. 
but it's still a subset of the data. And so we look at cancer in particular. My wife was a cancer patient. And how easy is it to get structured cancer data out of even the most modern electronic health record today? The answer is it's still tough, right? Things like where is the tumor? What is the nodal involvement? You know, are there distant metatastases? It's mostly written in notes. It's unstructured. And so I would say where we are is we've taken in a Pareto analysis the first bold steps to put in structured data, those things that are most important, but the tail will be very long. And certainly on areas like cancer, we really should move quickly so that the patients of the future have the benefit of the data from patients in the past. Well, you talked about coordinated care, and obviously that implies a certain level of coordination in the sharing of data, right? And I can tell you from my personal experience, and it's probably the experience of most healthcare consumers, data is not very portable. If I have a visit with someone who is different from my primary care physician, those visit notes, you know, even if it's a wellness screening, don't automatically make it to my, my chart. And then I have a discontinuity in my record. And that potentially hurts me because then my PCB has to come up to speed, et cetera, et cetera. You just magnify this problem across the entire healthcare system. So let me ask you this question. You mentioned data as a fundamental to the digital transformation. My census, and this could be a provocative statement, much is made of the potential for advanced analytics, but the vast majority of health systems are still deeply entrenched in retrospective analytics. What is your take on that? And of course, you have to look at different use cases, right? So if the use case is, oh, I am working on reimbursement, and well, reimbursement takes many forms, fee-for-service, value-based purchasing, but a retrospective analysis of performance and quality might work you know, as a short-term um, first effort. And you are correct that prospective, at point of care, workflow integrated, clinical decision support based on machine learning, care plans and algorithms is still very much a work in process. And where do I have hope? The FHIR CDS hooks specification, which basically says EHRs will be able to consume cloud services provided by external entrepreneurs inside the workflow so that you have more prospective guidance and best practices. It's early, it's coming. So yeah, you're right. For reimbursement purposes, a lot of retrospective analysis today, but for safety, quality, total medical expense control, fire CDS hooks and prospective point of care decision support coming in the next year to two. Right. Now, you mentioned FIRE, Fast Health Interoperability Resources, for those who may not be familiar with the acronym. We have to talk about, therefore, the I word, interoperability. And I know you've been deeply involved in efforts to standardize APIs, part of your work with HEMS, uh, the Argonaut Project. Can you tell us a little bit about the State of the Union on data interoperability? Well, sure. So if we do the very quick history of interoperability, remember in 1989, we said, oh, what we need is something that sends demographics and orders and results around, HL7v2. And actually, I mean, we've seen pretty good success of being able to knit together ancillary systems and core electronic health records with HL7v2. But that by no means is interoperability of your entire lifetime record or sufficient for many other use cases. So in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, we moved to XML forms. And although those were good at providing a summary record of an encounter, they were filled with optionality. You never quite knew what data you were going to get. And they were challenging to get, say, a subset. I just want to see the EKG or just the lab because they were a document, right? They were in the entire visit. So the next logical step after the CCDA was an API where you are able to query a resource and say, give me just this bits of data in a highly structured schema for this patient. And that notion is very empowering because it means that entrepreneurs without a huge amount of healthcare IT expertise, if given a spec for an API, 
can say, oh, well, all I need is the allergy information, and here's how I call it, and I'll get the substance, the reaction, the level of certainty, the observer, and a date timestamp with great consistency. I don't need to parse XML. I don't need a PhD in informatics. So we've got our EHR vendors going from V2 to CCDA and now to APIs. A federal regulatory requirement is likely to be on the books soon, requiring these Argonaut APIs for patients to easily access their core medical data. So, yeah, I think that trajectory is pretty good. Yeah, and that will be hugely empowering for patients as well. So we certainly hope that that happens sooner than later because it's been a vexed issue for several years running. So, John, we do something called a lightning round in my podcast where I ask for your top of mind thoughts. I ask my guests the top of mind thoughts on a handful of emerging technologies in health ID. So it's a perfect segue from our immediate last discussion. AI and machine learning, what are your thoughts? Sure. The challenge is you need to be careful about what use cases you pursue. And let me give you just two quick examples. So you ever flown a 737 MAX airplane? How do you feel about a machine learning algorithm based on a single sensor having closed loop control of flight control? Oh, that sounds very bad. <laughs> so when somebody <laughs> says, oh, I'll use you know, machine learning to control ventilators, drug dosing, make diagnoses, you say, hmm, you know, maybe what we want to start with are use cases that augment clinical decision-making by helping, say, narrow the scope of what are potential actions, but ultimately give those actions to humans. And all the machine learning work I'm doing is about augmenting and sifting through data. I'm not building any closed-loop use cases for now. Right. And when you say closed loop use cases, you're referring to use cases where the machine pretty much makes the decision on your behalf. Is that what you mean? Right. And may make a okay. ventilator change, a drug change, a diagnosis. You know, the machine is, in fact, without human intervention, creating a, an action that potentially could result in harm. Right. I don't think the public is ready for that either. I kind of agree with you on that. All right. Next one on the list. Voice recognition, Alexa, Siri, what do you think of those? So if you look at the history of our industry, and I'm 57, so I was there for the beginning of the PC revolution. I built an Altair 8800. Wow, we didn't need a mainframe. We could have something in our, our homes. And then we went from that to the web and from that to mobile. Well, to me, the next great natural extension of computing is ambient computing. And that is quick example for you. My mom, nearly 80, lives in Southern California, and I have, with her permission, created a comprehensive Google Home environment. So she simply walks around her home and says, oh, I'd like to watch this program. I'd like to listen to that music. Uh, could you give me information on this author? Uh, where do I buy this book? Right? And it's, she doesn't even think about it as being a computer. It is simply an ambient part of her environment. And certainly, I believe that this is the next direction for much of what we need to do in healthcare is we just, whether we're a clinician creating a chart or a patient trying to navigate the healthcare system, we're using these ambient tools and not typing. That's a fascinating use case. Do, the, do you ever have privacy concerns around this pervasive use of the technology in the home and this constant stream of information? that is being gathered up in servers at the back end somewhere? Right. And of course, every one of us has a different privacy preference. And you know, in my particular case, I have made the decision that the, you know, since I run a 70 acre farm, the entire farm is ambient computing enabled. The convenience and efficiency of having ambient computing for me to get through my day outweighs what I perceive as my privacy risks. But everyone mm -hmm. may feel differently. And in fact, on uh, the ambient computing devices on the farm, there is an on-off switch. So those who feel uncomfortable simply turn it off. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> right, right. Okay. All right. The next one on the list. This is something that you have become quite an expert on. Blockchain. 
Right. So again, with blockchain, you just have to pick your use cases carefully. Uh, is blockchain a data analytic platform? No. Is it an interoperability platform? No. An identity management platform? No. Is it fast? No. Is it easy to use? No. But uh, things like ensuring data integrity, I can prove that a medical record was not altered or a public ledger that enables me to find information about doctors, uh, location or credentials or the notion that I, as a patient, might declare my privacy preferences and consents in a public ledger for general reuse. These are some use cases that absolutely have promise. So it will not solve all problems, but it certainly is handy to solve a few. Right, right. And you mentioned the uh, provider directory and you know alliances like the Synaptic Health Alliance are trying to solve for just that problem. What really is a critical success factor for a blockchain initiative to gain widespread adoption? Is it the network effect? Is it something else? And the answer, of course, it's value, alignment of incentives. So, for example, uh, as a physician, I have over 1,000 insurance companies that want my provider directory information and my credentialing data and things of that nature. It's a nightmare. So if what you said was we now have a, a who cares is this blockchain? We have a workflow that is going to radically reduce complexity in your dealing with insurance companies. Great. Anything that saves me time, <laughs> reduces cost, yeah. a, you know, prevents public embarrassment, whatever, you know, that will be a critical success factor for adoption. Right, right. Okay, last one in the lightning round. Extended reality, AR, VR. Sure. So uh, many of my surgical colleagues feel the notion of taking imaging studies and overlaying those in a field of view as one is doing an operation provides a level of guidance and safety. Certainly the notion of training using AR, VR is important, and many of the sim centers do that fairly well. So as a physician who trained in a very old-fashioned dissect a cadaver, and by the way, the tissue is largely degraded and very hard to visualize, I absolutely see the value of both augmentation and training using these techniques. Right, right. I'm actually familiar with that use case. Uh, it's a startup that I'm aware of that uses haptics to simulate the whole uh, cadaver experience we just described. It's fascinating. Okay, let's switch back to digital health. Now, this week has been a big week for digital health. Two big IPOs, Health Catalyst, Livongo. Hard to escape, you know, all the attention that, that's going into those two. So $10 billion in VC money every year, give or take. Most startups are struggling. And after a long drought, we have three digital health IPOs this year. What's your take on the current state of digital health startups and digital health adoption? Are we turning the corner here, or are we going to continue to struggle for a little longer? What's your take? Sure. So I think there are some worldwide societal problems to address, like the aging society, lack of access to appropriate specialists. And so when I look at some of these digital health startups, which are doing Internet of Things, telemedicine, AI, machine learning, they are addressing some of these major societal problems. So as John Cotter at the Harvard Business School tells us, none of us is going to change unless there's an urgency to change. And having healthcare at 18 or 19 percent of the GDP, an aging society, a low birth rate and not enough care is an urgency to change. So it seems Sorry. to me that the next couple of years we'll see these digital health startups become a essential part of our healthcare system and potentially could even reduce some costs, or if nothing else, bend the cost curve. Right, right. Okay, we're pretty much coming up to the end of our time here, John, and I have one last question for you. In your career, 23 years as a CIO and more, you've you know, successfully reinvented yourselves, yourself a few times over. What advice do you have for those coming into CIO roles in health systems today? I, you know, I am often asked to predict the future, and I say I can look ahead six quarters. Beyond that, who can predict, right? Who would have predicted the Internet's impact in 1993? So I think the answer right. is, is just be agile 
recognize your time horizons are short and take risks because you don't quite know what technology is going to triumph. So try a lot of them, fail fast, and eventually one will hit. And as you point out, the reinvention looks like it was planned. Well, it's to be honest, sometimes just good luck. <laughs> That's a candid assessment. John, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and look forward to following all of your writings in the Geek Doctor blog and the blockchain newsletter, among the other things that you're doing. Thank you once again. Well, absolutely. Glad to be here and thank you. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info at thebigunlock.com.